Our uh, guest in the next segment is Jason Upman. He is the State Director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia. Jason, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Rob. How are you? I am well. I'm actually getting a little bit hungry, but uh, I'm going to hang in there. I can handle it. Uh, let's... You're a grown boy. you gotta, you got to eat. Oh, yeah, that's the truth, man. you got, you got to you gotta fuel the engine, buddy, right? you got to keep it going. So we, you'll be happy to know we've got your uh, picture again there. I think you said this was from your wedding? It was, yeah. Probably the best, best photo ever taken of me. Man. Good photo. Awesome. Good photo, yeah. James I, Bond I would, photo. I wouldn't totally. think he would walk around every day uh, in a blue suit and looking, blue tux. looking, looking good. Devin like Aaron Swaff, yeah. 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 Uh, solving crimes. Uh, let's talk about Joe Manchin. Jason, and a campaign that AFP West Virginia recently launched. Uh, I'm gonna, I, will, I will say this is against Joe Manchin. Tell me what this is about. Well, okay, let's put things in context. Uh, right now there's a piece of legislation that Republicans in Washington have passed called H.R. 1, the Lower Energy Cost Act. Uh, and I think as, as folks will remember, you know, President Biden promised on the campaign trail to end fossil fuels. And for more than two years, He's basically waged a war on American energy by adopting a, a host of policies that have made energy more expensive for families across the country. You, know, you tie that in with inflation and you get uh, uh, kind of economic doldrums like you haven't seen since the Carter administration, right? And so to try to reverse this regrettable course, um, Republicans in Washington have passed the Lower Energy Cost Act through the House. Unfortunately, uh, President Biden's guy in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, says this bill is dead on arrival. And so what we're trying to do is, uh, Rob, connect folks with Senator Manchin's office, ask him to stand up to his party uh, by sending this bill to, to President Biden's desk. That's all you want the public to do, just say, hey, send it to President Biden's desk. Absolutely. Huh? Um, no, I have I have reservations and doubts as to whether Senator Manchin will do that, given his track record. Um, but, you know, all you can do is ask in these situations, right? You can only ask people to do the right thing and hope that they will uh, they will have the political courage to do so. It appears that from a release I saw last week, part of the Inflation Reduction Act bill uh, included some projects that would go into West Virginia, and it looked like it might have been an exchange for Senator Manchin's vote. One of those was something that developed into Form Energy over in the, the northern panhandle. And uh, there's nothing illegal about this. This is, you know, one of those things that happens all the time uh, with politicians. And Form Energy, of course, is a battery storage uh, in, uh, b business model, which many folks in the fossil fuel business uh, came out as concerned that uh, we would put something like this in West Virginia. Is this all kind of tied in together, Jason? You know, I, I don't want to speculate, but I mean, I think it, in the IRA, for sure, the Inflation Reduction Act that you know, I look at it as a betrayal by Senator Manchin of, of West Virginia's values. And there was a ton of crony capitalism in there, uh, handouts to green energy corporations. And uh, frankly, you know, that came at the cost of increased spending, which made inflation worse, um, <laughs> increase in taxes, uh, energy taxes um, that made energy more expensive. So whatever kind of deal was made there, not a good one, was not uh, not well thought out think probably the senator could have done a better job but in any event um, we oppose that piece of legislation and really the the lower energy cost act is, is almost a sort of um, direct response to that type of top-down energy regulation what we want um, is permitting um, being able to go through easier uh, the reduction of energy taxes uh, and that's going to help lower prices, you know, from the gas station to the grocery store and make American industry more competitive. Because right now what we have is a paradigm where government is standing in the way intentionally of citizens having access to reliable, affordable energy. And we have to reverse that course because, uh, as we know, you know we don't want to be reliant on, you know, potentially um, hazardous foreign actors. Uh, we have all of the means by which and resources by which to have uh, a truly abundant energy structure in the country. And this bill's going to help us get there if only, you know, folks like Joe Manchin will stand up to, to President Biden and pass it. John Gilstrap. 
I heard on the news yesterday the Biden administration is pushing uh, legis- or regulation that would see, I think it's in the next 10 years, north of 70 percent of all cars in America have to be electric. And Senator Manchin pushed back rather um, vigorously against that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, I mean, any time that you have this sort of uh, forced transition of technology um, that is, you know, basically sped up by Washington, D.C. and and folks who think they know better than uh, the average Joe on the street who's being forced into these uh, consumer decisions, uh, (laughs) I think it's probably not a good call, right? I I don't think there's anybody out there who doesn't want to um, look at energy production from a more holistic perspective. Um, there's all kinds of technology out there that could that could contribute to us lowering energy costs. Uh, and I think from our perspective, we really want to see uh, American ingenuity and innovation lean into those concepts and, and us to be a leader when it comes to energy again, as opposed to um, sort of being behind the eight ball, if you will, in terms of uh, our energy production, being reliant on other folks, and, and generally um, just having a less reliable grid. It seems to me that Senator Manchin is sort of changing his his stripes a little bit here um, as, I, well, election's not that close, but we're two years or a year and a half away from it. He seems to be uh, saying much more conservative things than he used to and seems to be posturing against the administration more than, than he used to. Does that mean, um, do, you, do you think he's uh, he's concerned about his poll numbers? Well, I would be. <laughs> I was in his camp, right? I mean... You know, he's taken some bad votes, and West Virginians are paying attention to that. Um, You know, Senator Manchin tends to do this thing where he gets real conservative around an election cycle. Um, But, you know, I think it's a lot of bluster, right? Again, we go back to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, All of the tax increases and energy tax increases and, you know, the, the host of things that I think run counter to where West Virginians are at um, that he bargained for for maybe some some green energy handouts. Uh, I I just I don't see it. Um, you know, on on the political thought process, Joe Manchin even run again? I don't know. Uh, I think that's that's to be determined, right? Um, I, I was in his camp again, looking at the the, the state um, that has become increasingly red. Um, you know, maybe he goes the way of uh, of. Um, say he wants to not go out on a loss, right? Potentially, mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll see. I think um, Bill Kerr. I think that uh, he he will run again. Um, he really, he doesn't know nothing but what he's been doing. And you know, it, it depending on which way the wind is blowing and where how that vote's going to be cast. And but Jason, you talked about reaching out to Senator Manchin and getting to move this bill on to President Biden. Do do you really think? I mean, so many times we 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 contact our our legislators and and is it just wasted air or wasted? Um, emails or phone calls because they're they're pretty much already decided do you do you feel that there's really any i mean honestly do you feel there's a possibility of people reaching out that he'll change his mind and and get it moving forward or or? well i mean from my perspective it's it's always the right thing for citizens to reach out and let their lawmakers know where they stand on issues right and that's the bread and butter of what americans for prosperity stands for um we want to get people engaged in the policy process again you know too often i hear folks that that feel uh, fatalistic about not only the you know their their place in the legislative process frankly but the the trajectory of the country Mm -hmm. and i don't think that necessarily needs to be the case right um, man makes his own luck, and I think that, you know, when it comes to citizens voicing their concerns, um, it's always, always a good thing for folks to reach out. Uh, and so we're trying to facilitate that, right? I think, you know, these issues, a lot of politicians um, would like to not deal with them, would like to uh, just go along to get along in Washington. Um, we'll see if Joe Manchin's going to be the kind of guy that wants to stand up to his party and do the right thing, or if he wants to go along to get along. You would need, if, if Manchin would vote for this, then we would still need one more senator who would go along with this for it to pass, Jason. And then, of course, you would need President Biden to sign it, and we know that probably isn't going to happen. Is there another senator besides Manchin that you folks are actively looking at to influence? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, across the country, there there are key senators that we think are in a position um, similarly to, to stand up to their party or otherwise um, advance this issue. Um, and you know, we're we're taking a pretty holistic approach. You know, we're we're talking to folks in Arizona, Montana, Nevada, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, along with West Virginia. And so, you know, we think that we've got a potential pathway um, to at least highlight this issue, make sure citizens know that it is something that um, needs to happen. Uh, H.R. 1 is, is going to be a boon for American industry and American citizens in terms of the energy prices they're paying. And so we think it's a really important thing to highlight. And, and listen, you know, these things sometimes happen in a vacuum, but long term, right, um, there's an election coming up. Um, there's the potential to have, you know, a, a new president in 2025, uh, a new Congress in 2025. And really, these kind of ideas um, may be on the shelf for the time being, but eventually we'll be in a position where I think we'll have principled leaders who will advance these kind of common sense, uh, proven policies that we know are going to help people. Jason Huffman is our guest here on the program. He is the state director of Americans for Prosperity, uh, West Virginia. How long will you keep the campaign going, Jason? Well, I think, uh, you know... (laughs) Senator Schumer has said that it's DOA, so I think we could uh, have potentially a, a pretty long time to talk about this. And, you know, frankly, not a problem. We, we like to get out there <laughs> into the communities and talk to folks and knock on doors and uh, have a conversation about important legislation like this. And so uh, the more that we're able to connect with people uh, and, again, um, you know, I think depict things in a way that, that perhaps uh, makes folks feel less fatalistic about the, the trajectory of the country like they do have some power to do something um always always a good thing and always something that we're we're endeavoring to do so we start by getting gasoline prices lower once again well they seem to get lower at times and then the next day it's like they shoot right back up well we're going to reduce it because of taxes we're going to give them that tax break and then it seems like the next week well something happens either a refinery as soon as opec makes a statement about uh, supply right and then all of a sudden it that day boom that day it, <laughs> they come down slowly they go up in one day yes though. absolutely or one minute sometimes while you're standing there at the pump uh jason let's talk about the legislative session that concluded we just had an interim session uh that uh, concluded as well and there was tax relief for west virginians in this past legislative session that's the first time in how long since there's been a tax cut in west virginia a broad-based one i'm not talking about the niche ones that they've done in the past um, to my knowledge, in terms of comprehensive sort of tax reform, and, and uh, this is the largest tax cut in West Virginia history. Uh, I think the last time that that our you know income tax rates were adjusted, I want to say maybe early '80s, because mm-hmm. um, if you look at what used to be the the top marginal rate in the state, that was it was set at sixty thousand um, dollars, six point five percent, and so what that tells us is that. <laughs> Whenever that was put into place, sixty thousand dollars was a lot more than it is, uh, you know, in in this economy and inflation, uh, inflation adjusted. So it's been quite some time. I ran the numbers on that sixty thousand dollar figure because we had a local CPA Ken Apple on. We were talking about this, and if it was adjusted for inflation, that top rate would now be around one hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars. But it hasn't yeah, been. That, that- that sounds that sounds about right, but I mean, you know, don't forget we we had the 14th highest top marginal rate in the country, uh, and beginning at an amount that was not inflation adjusted, so mm-hmm. it was just totally out of step with um, what we needed to do to be competitive as a state. And so, I mean, we're 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 tickled to death that lawmakers took um, fairly bold action with regards to you know passing the largest income tax cut in state history, and and now we've got triggers in place that are going to continue to bring those rates down as the state um, has surplus. So that's really important because instead of, you know, lawmakers having to take additional legislative action and instead of uh, government continuing to grow its coffers beyond what it needs to operate, um, what we're going to see instead is, you know, the ability for reductions to occur in statute already. And so that's, that's really important. And I think moving forward, you know, um, we'll see how those triggers work. I, I think that they're fairly solid. Um, but, you know, you can always go back and adjust as needed. But I think really thoughtfully done and, and extremely prudent move that was much needed for the state. 
West Virginia has a surplus projected this year to be around $1.7, $1.8 billion. We had the vice chair of finance, John Hardy, on yesterday, and he said $1.3 billion of that is already spoken for, Jason, leaving the actual surplus somewhere around four or $500 million. Not that that's not a lot of money, but it's certainly not the full $1.7, $1.8 billion. Right, right. Well, I, I assume that some of that has to do with, you know, they cut taxes by $750 million, which is, um, if government's going to use the surplus, uh, that's certainly the right way to use it by giving it back to taxpayers, right? Because, um, you know, as we've, as we've seen over the years in West Virginia, we have to uh, find a way to incentivize people to, to call West Virginia home. And I think that we were out of step when it comes to taxation. People pay attention to that. You know, the states that uh, have um, no income tax, that levy no income tax, grow at double the rate in terms of population uh, as states that do levy an income tax. So the closer we can get to phasing that thing out, the more competitive we are. Uh, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum, and, and lawmakers have done you know, yeoman's work in terms of passing policies that we know um, will incentivize folks to move here, cut red tape, um, generally make uh, opportunity a, a more robust opportunity for folks who, who want to thrive in West Virginia. So it's good stuff. And, and they did a lot of other good things this session. Um, one of the bills that they passed, uh, House Bill 2596, um, open enrollment for public schools. Now, we had that on the books already. Um, but what we wanted to do was just shore up the ability of parents through open enrollment to send their child to any public school that they want to. Um, regardless of their res- residential assignment, because it should not be the case um, that a kid is not able to get the education that's right for them because of their income or their zip code. And, you know, we have a constitutional mandate in this state to provide a, a thorough and efficient education. And so um, that piece of legislation is extremely important uh, because we, we've shored up parents' ability to say, hey, you know what, this public school isn't working for my kid. I think I'd like to go to this other public school instead. Um, and nobody can stop them as long as there's a seat for that child in the school. And so that's that's a big deal. Why would Americans for Prosperity take an interest in public school bills in, involving transfers? Well, uh, I mean, because we're the we're the education freedom folks, right? And uh, I think it you know too often it becomes a conversation about you know private school versus public school when really what we need to be talking about instead. Uh, is what's right for kids. You know, I don't think that, uh, and we've never been um, at least intentionally antagonistic toward uh, public school. Uh, If you'll note a lot of the conversations that we had when we passed the education savings account bill, um, really agnostic in terms of uh, how education is delivered, as long as the child is receiving what uh, education suits their unique needs most. And so, um, part of that might be folks who want to take the Hope Scholarship, which again was, you know, set at edu- West Virginia as a as a education freedom leader with with the gold standard for education freedom throughout the country, because um, it allowed parents to to take the Hope Scholarship, receive some of their tax dollars back uh, to to purchase the education that is right for their kid, be that public, private, um, what have you, uh, individual learning program, homeschool. So, you know. The next echelon of this and sort of the next logical step is to say, okay, well, if folks can uh, go outside of that public system, uh, we need to focus on the public system. And so I think that allowing families to, you know, pick which public school they want to go to uh, is only going to be a a rising tide that lifts all ships in terms of uh, children having the right education for them. Jason Huffman, our guest, State Director of Americans for Prosperity, uh, West Virginia, Mr. Gilstrap. The, obviously, we want to draw more people to the state, and we want to provide economic opportunities for more people in, in the state. I'm curious, it'll be interesting to see how this balances out with the reality that what is most attractive, among what is most attractive in West Virginia, is its bucolic nature. And um, once we, assuming we get a... a, a influx of tens of thousands of people a year into West Virginia, which is which is good for the economy. It's not so good for the eastern panhandle and northern panhandle, the economic areas driving uh, the areas that drive the economics of the state. And the southern part of the state really has its other natural problems in terms of geography and such that, that make development there 
difficult. So it would all be concentrated in the eastern and northern Panhandle areas where the economic drivers are now. And, you know, I just I look across the river at Loudoun County, eastern Loudoun County, with all those data centers. And it's Loudoun County is, to me, the poster child of don't let this happen here. So it's a very delicate balance that, that we're working with here. And it would be interesting to see how it works out. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not super familiar with Loudoun County, um, but I think what what you're getting at, I guess, is in terms of it's become very industrialized not, and unattractive. Uh, okay, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Uh, well, listen, I mean, I know that you know folks have a preference in their community based on um, you know uh, zoning. I guess is, is a, a, a concern that folks have, um, but generally speaking, I mean. We want to see the rest of the state grow too, right? You guys have done a great job in the Eastern Panhandle of, of help keeping the the state's head above water in terms of uh, our population. Um, you know, I think we we just hit a milestone in that we didn't lose population for this first time. There's there's folks moving here. Um, however, we're still having more more deaths than births in terms of the actuarial charts, and so. Um, Listen, we, we've got plenty of room in West Virginia, I think, to, to grow, maybe less so in the eastern panhandle, um, because you guys have been doing, frankly, just a, a better job in terms of economic growth. Well, it doesn't hurt that Washington, D.C. is just down the road, Jason. There's a, there's a lot that contributes to that. And uh, we've got well, the interstate highway. we, we won't hold that against you all. No, I'm just, I'm just yeah. <laughs> it, it helps economically, though. I, I, just I, a short train ride or a, yeah. away. A lot of folks who, who work in these suburbs of D.C. and and uh, and live here, and that helps. Hey, uh, do, have you guys come out with your legislative scorecard yet, uh, Jason? We are about to. Um, it is going to come out very soon, and uh, you know we'll definitely keep folks posted on uh, on when that's going to release. But um, very excited to. Yeah, you know, I think this will be. We've been doing this since 2018, so uh, happy to to keep the the tradition alive. And uh, just shameless plug for that, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that votes in the legislature were not roll called. They weren't recorded anywhere. So people didn't know how their lawmakers voted. And a, and a delegate by the name of John Overington mm -hmm. uh, led the charge to change all of that. And so in, in the spirit of uh, Delegate Overington, we release a scorecard every year just so folks know where their lawmakers stood on key issues. And we're excited to, to bring that to folks again this year soon. Two of the things John was most known for involved that, what you just mentioned, and introducing capital punishment each year into the legislature as a potential, which uh, never went anywhere, by the way. <laughs> we, and we, Craig, Craig Blair kind of brought that back into uh, the conversation this past week. Jason, what do you think about that? I mean, we're, we're starkly against, I think, the, the incorporation of, of the capital punishment. And, and one of the main reasons for that is... It's just ridiculously expensive, um, and I don't think that it is something that the state should prioritize uh, because, you know, does it deter folks from committing those kinds of crimes? I don't know. I don't think the data bears that out. So I, I think it's probably uh, – I get uh, the sentiment, uh, but I don't think that's the right policy approach because I don't think the data backs it up. There was a great episode of Real Sports with Brian Gumbel on HBO. I don't know if anybody out there saw the most recent one. There was a fellow who was in prison for 17 years, maybe longer, for a murder he did not commit. And eventually he was freed by an attorney who spent 15, 20, 25 years in prison when he was falsely convicted of the murder of his own parents. And uh, when he got out of prison, he became an attorney. He took up the cause of this guy who was imprisoned uh, wrongly and uh, both served many, many years for murders they never committed. If there was a death penalty, it's possible that neither one of those two would have ever made it to the point of exoneration. So interesting take. Well, and there's too many of those kind of stories out there, right, where yep. it just gives you so much pause. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't really trust the government <laughs> with that kind of power. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's just me, perhaps. Jason, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning. Yeah, appreciate you all having me on. Have a great day, sir. You too. Jason Huffman.